welcome you back to the Fresh Expressions podcast. I'm Gannon Sims. And I'm Heather Jalad. And we've got an exciting episode uh, here for you uh, talking uh, again with our friend Todd Bolsinger uh, on adaptive leadership because it's just something we frankly can't talk about enough. Um, and, you know, w- what, what we learned from, from Todd and, 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 you know, the interview you were able to, to uh, conduct with Todd, Heather, is just the a courage as a leader to say these very important words. And those words are, I don't know. Seems to me the most instructive thing uh, that we we learned from Todd. What what did you learn from Todd, Heather? Yes, that was really like the beginning of his whole journey in adaptive leadership, the I don't know, uh, getting to the point where he could say, I don't know. I think a lot of times um, as leaders, maybe it's just me, I don't know. But I, I think that, that we get to the place where we don't know, but we don't let on that we don't know. Is is that just me, Ken? <laughs> 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 and I think that having the humility to to say that and what what that does, Heather, is it creates a mutuality in leadership. Yeah. And, and we're so accustomed to leading uh, authoritatively. And it, it, we want to be strong leaders. We don't want to be perceived right. as, I hate saying the word, we don't want to be perceived as weak. Um, right. We want to know where we're going. But I feel like in the life of the church, if we are going to be part of the triune community, we are, we mm. are deferring to one another. We're calling each mm, other yeah. out. And, and that's the leader's job, I think. Right. And, and he really names that as a, the, that was the beginning of his adaptive leadership uh, uh, trajectory, but very much a different form of leadership and being able to say out loud, I don't know. And, uh, and, and in doing so, kind of uh, uh, leading this community of faith on a journey where uh, they recognized that they had to let go of what had worked in the past. Uh, and and I think that, you know, obviously, this is a very poignant message for all of us right now, um, uh, coming out of the, the eternal cycle of coming out of COVID, which, you know, oh. I don't think we're ever going to necessarily come out of, but um, how things have changed so dramatically over the last couple of years and 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 you're there's still yet a, a desire to kind of go back or uh, and this this very real I think uh uh battle that we fight with defaulting to the things that we've always done or the way we've always done things it's it's a real it's a real fight to to break out of those it those is, molds. It is. I, I was talking with Tim Lee on the UK Fresh Expressions team the other day, and he, he was just like, you've got to schedule the not mm. normal. Mm. Yeah. Otherwise, the normal just takes over, and we've got to do the normal. Um, but it's we've so got to create good. that. We really need a time block, that time for, for white space for creativity. So um, without further ado, I, I just want to you know pitch it over and, and learn uh, from your conversation with Todd Bolsinger. Yeah, this is really all about learning to lead when you don't know what to do next. And I think we can take a lot of a lot of notes from uh, this conversation with Todd Bolsinger from his work uh, uh, that we've seen uh, kind of uh, be shared with the community over these last few years, canoeing the mountains, uh, timbered resilience, and with great anticipation of, of what he is working on right now and what's to come. Um, y'all have a listen, take some notes, listen again. And, um, and we would love to hear how this episode of the fresh expressions podcast has impacted you. Hi, everybody. It is great to be back for season two of the fresh expressions podcast. Um, our guest today is someone that I know you're going to enjoy hearing from uh, su- uh, for such a time as this person that um, that is really kind of a thought leader in adaptive church leadership. Um, our guest today is Executive Director of Church Leadership, the Church Leadership Institute at Fuller Seminary, uh, Todd Bolsinger. Um, I would say, uh, Todd, I'll, I'll let you say a few words in a minute, but I would say reading Canoeing the Mountains back in 2016 um, and, and Tempered Resilience in 2020, um, 
they felt like books of prophecy at the beginning of the pandemic to me. Uh, and certainly they were identifying a lot of the challenges that were already before us, but were certainly um, brought to light in a whole new way with uh, the pandemic. So um, talk, talk a little bit about yourself and how you got into this whole uh, adaptive leadership uh, that is so, so important to us right now as the church. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it being asked. Um, so I was a pastor for 27 years. Uh, 10 years, I trained at one of the iconic Presbyterian churches in the country, Hollywood Presbyterian. They kind of raised me up from literally from the basement to the pulpit. <laughs> like I started in the basement doing college ministry. And when I left, my last sermon was in the pulpit. And I said goodbye as a associate pastor who'd been on their staff during a big transition. And then I became the senior pastor at San Clemente Presbyterian Church. And I ended up talking Talking and learning about adaptive leadership because I went through this weird moment in my leadership where I literally didn't know what to do. Um, I found myself like kind of stuck. I'd we'd been in the church and had a really wonderful season. Things had gone in all the right directions, up and to the right, as they say, with all the numbers, uh, all the metrics were going up, and the morale was going down. People were burning out. <laughs> they were oh boy. Um, they were not saying yes to leadership. They were getting cynical. I, I didn't I didn't know what to do about that. I, I literally found myself, somebody asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And I didn't realize that I don't know is the beginning of a different form of leadership. And that's called adaptive leadership. It's when you have to learn as you go. And a lot of times you have to let go of what worked in the past. And so that took me on a journey that has now been 15 years um, and around the world, literally, and written two books on the subject and now working on a third big one and another series and speaking to people literally all over the world and, and in really different places about how do you learn to lead when you literally don't know what to do next. And and that's what happened to the entire church during the pandemic. So so we're, we're all in good company. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually had, had, like I said, I'd read Canoeing the Mountains back in 2015 or 2016 and, um, and had picked it up again, literally at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was like, oh my goodness. Um, it, 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 it honestly did feel like a, a book of prophecy and, and at the same time felt just so helpful to try to, to navigate the, the uncharted territory before us, as mm -hmm. as you use the metaphor of the the Lewis and Clark expedition and, and canoeing the mountains, and so many poignant um, uh, lessons, examples uh, that that you share in that book. Yeah. Um, that I yeah, I can't commend it enough to people. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank so you. much I to learn. I, I just I, you know, and 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 thinking about our conversation today, um, one of the things that I really um, this really kind of, of came to mind for me is really the, the, the necessity of the reliance on Lewis and Clark um, uh, on, and I, I know I mispronounce her name. I've always called her Sacagawea. So why don't you say a little bit about that? Because I, I'm, I'm puzzled and even a little bit confounded by the uh, humility that it took from these men. And maybe, maybe humility is not the right word to, to rely on this young woman who uh, you know, to navigate the way that they didn't know. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. Yeah. Yeah. So the big, the giant lesson of the story of Lewis and Clark is that the world in front of you is nothing like the world behind you. That you can be the master of your domain. You can be a master of divinity. You can, you can yeah. have, like, right? You can have a master, a mastery of the way the world worked and the way the world was and the way the church was. And we are now in a place where it is rapidly changing, where the world in front of us is no longer the same as the world behind us. And it requires us to learn to lead all over again. You're learning in real time at, in the same time that you're leading. And one of the big stories about Sacagawea, I got, like I learned her name. There like you, you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I learned it as Sacagawea. That's what we often call uh -huh. it. But they wrote down in the journal, her name is Sacagawea, Sacagawea. And so I think it's important to give her back her name. And it's important to recognize that even they acknowledged that they would never have made it through the mountains without her. And the, the difference was, is that when they went over the Lemhi Pass, which is between Montana and Idaho, and they discovered there wasn't any water route, that's what they were looking for. And they were facing these rocky mountains that looked different than any mountains anybody from the eastern United States had ever seen. They realized 
she was the only one who wasn't lost. This was her terrain. And what we often talk about is one of the big lessons of adaptive leadership is the future is already here. It's just on the margins. It's in the people that you're ignoring. It's in the people, the voices we haven't heard. It's in the people who didn't have power and privilege and training in the old world. It's often, I mean, quite frankly, the places that are beginning to thrive in the church going forward are places where there are more diversity of voices, more diversity of experiences, more openness to learning from people that in the past we would have said, well, they don't have the credentials, the degree or the experience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, and, and so one of the reasons why I like working with Fresh Expressions is that there is this humility about saying, yes, the inherited church thrived in the past and we love it and take care of it and affirm it. But there are experiments to happen on the margins with new people that we would never expect that are like the Chicago Weas that are leading us into the future. And and I do think you're right. It takes a kind of humility. I also think it takes a, a necessity. I, I'm not convinced that yeah. Mary, Meriwether Lewis, having been trained by Thomas Jefferson, was all that open to Chicago Wea <laughs> when he first met her. He didn't write down a single word she said. But they walked over the Lemhi Pass and they needed her. And so they began yeah. to be more open and learn more. And I think a lot of church leaders are in that place today. Yeah. Well, they say that the des- uh, that the, the desperation is a seedbed of innovation, right? Or, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, we don't know what to do. And, 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 and maybe, maybe there are others that, that can show us the way and, uh, and really, the, like you said, the openness to do things differently, to try things differently, to, to recognize that um, what has been working perhaps for um, decades, centuries, whatever, is not working anymore. And, um, and, and there's, a, there's a, a, I think Fresh Expressions does a great job of, of recognizing the gifts of the inherited church while also... Um, uh, the the possibility of of doing an old thing a new way, which is yeah. frankly what Jesus told his disciples he was going to teach them to do, right? An old thing a new way. Um, right. So I think there's there's something significant there um, for us. So you say people on the margins, people um, diversity, people that we wouldn't necessarily um, uh, look at, look to as as experts or leaders, p- perhaps as the church. Um, can you give some, um, examples who are, who are you learning from? What are you learning from as far as adaptive leadership is concerned? Well, well, let me give you an example of what something that happened just last week, right? So, um, last week I started my week in San Antonio, Texas, talking to a group of a thousand Pentecostal pastors who were, um, they were all Pentecostals, but they were as diverse socioeconomically and racially as you can imagine. And they were all eager to learn about uh, how to lead differently and how to le- and how to lead with resilience. Well, then I went to a little tiny university in rural Virginia, where fifty pastors and students showed up to learn there too. And then I went to Queens, New York, and t- spent two days. And over sixty church planters and church members of churches, all immigrant churches, all in mm-hmm. all in New York, all showed up to learn. What I'm learning is the folks who we wouldn't expect like these, none of these single people were a a big platform. None of these people are going to be on any of the giant conferences. Mm -hmm. None of them are going to be the kind of people who uh, reread their books. They're all out there practitioners who are learning as they go. And, And part of what I learned from them is they often speak into my work and remind me, Hey, in our context, you're going to have to adapt even your work this way. And that's particularly true when I was working with this community of church planters who are mostly in Queens, New York. Queens, New York, this was one neighborhood in Queens that is 100,000 people and has over 150 languages. It is the most diverse zip code in the world. And it's right there. And there are folks working on planning churches in that environment. And in almost every case, whenever they have talked to like traditional church planters, they haven't understood the uniqueness of that context. So Mm -hmm. one of the things I'm really learning is adaptive leadership is powerful because it takes seriously, not only your traditions that you want to honor, but your context, which is the place that God has put you to minister. And that's been very powerful for me. I, I, I often get critiqued in really good and helpful ways 
by people who are saying in our context, adaptive leadership works. We just have to adapt even what you said this way. And Mm -hmm. every single time it is fruitful and helpful for me too. So good. So, so good. There's, there's so much to, to learn. And I think the more we, um, you said something that, that really resonated, um, that I, I know we share often in, in fresh expressions, um, as the team, as the trainers, as the staff, is that we're, we're not the experts, but we're practitioners and we're here to walk with you, you know, um, and, and to figure this out together. And I think that's, that's so significant and also recognizes that, uh, none of us have arrived and we're all, uh, trying to kind of, um, navigate this new territory together. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and there's a lot for us to, to learn along the way. I think this whole idea of, um, not only are we called to to be uh, to, to to transform the world um, as a United Methodist, that's part of our mission. But the world transforms us, and um, and and we are changed in the process. And uh, and and more and more, I believe that we're we're the disciples that are made in the going and the changing and the adapting um, as much as as we make disciples. So there there's a mutuality that happens along the way that that has to be held in high regard. I think, um, as we learn from one another. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And context is super important. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) For sure. So, so as we talk about like navigating, uh, the, the adaptive challenges we have in front of us, I know sometimes, um, our default is to, to apply technical solutions to adaptive challenges. So could you kind of unpack that a little bit for everybody? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is like the hub of the way to think about uh, adaptive leadership. So technical solutions are not trivial. They're just solutions that are already in your repertoire. So technical solutions are solutions experts can bring. So I always joke, I said, look, if you need a pastor to show up at a hospital when someone's dying, they've been trained how to do that. And in some communities, they may be one of the few people trained how to do that. If you need somebody who can also um, run a youth program, almost every pastor has figured out how to run a youth program. We all have five different games we can do up our sleeves no matter what, right? (laughs) Um, If you need someone to preach on the Trinity, they can do that too, usually without committing heresy, like, right? Like there's really important (laughs) skills. It's a little bit like the same thing is true in a medical field. Like if you're, my dad ha- had a heart bypass. We went to the doctor who invented the procedure. He was an expert. My dad was nervous, but the guy said, Mr. Bolsinger, I do these four to five times a week. I, I know what I'm doing. That's technical solutions are expertise. There's, it, there's very valuable. The problem is, is when you get into a place where there is no expertise, mm. what people end up doing is they end up using their old solutions in a new terrain. That it's a little bit like to use the canoe in the mountains metaphor. It's like really paddling harder in a canoe when there is no water in the river. <laughs> like if you <laughs> run out of water, don't paddle harder. What you're going to have to do is drop the canoe. And that's painful. Yeah. If you came on the trip because you're a water guy and you're really an expert water ra- rafter and a water navigator. And now we tell you you're going to have to walk and you have to carry luggage it's a different identity. There's a loss in there. Mm -hmm. So what adaptive leadership is about is leading when there is no expertise, there's no solution. We have to learn as you go. You've got to deal with loss every single time. And one of the most important parts is you're going to have to navigate competing values. And those competing values are often experienced as a win-lose. You're going to have to drop something to move forward. You're going to have to change something in order to adapt, adapt to, the, uh, to the new terrain. It's, it's difficult. You can't just get to a win-win solution the way we might have been able to get through in the past. And, and that's why adaptive leadership is really leadership that you learn as you go in the process of learning. And, it's, and it requires a different kind of skill set. Um, then, you know, preparing ahead of time and then rolling out your perfectly uh, prepared plans. Yeah, that's good. It's, it's uncomfortable. Um, it's unexpected. Uh, it is, uh, you know, just there, you can't anticipate what's going to happen next. 
And, yeah. and I think that's, <laughs> I think we're all firmly in that place. We, we, as much as we would like to think we know what's going to happen next, we don't know what's going to happen next. So yeah. um, as far as church leadership is concerned and, and what the, what the future looks like. So um, I guess the question would be what, what gets you most excited about the future of the church? Hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was asked that question just last week when I was in this amazing week with these really different places. And at the beginning of the week, I had just come off of a phone call with a pastor that I met and that I've worked with. I mean, he's a pastor of a mega church, 8,000 member church, multi-site, big, er, big uh, urban context in the South. And he was having a really hard day. He was really depressed. He said, he said, you know, 30 years of doing ministry and the pandemic made me worry if I've wasted my time. He said, when I saw the way my church members treated each other on Facebook over things like vaccines and masks and who they're going to vote for politically, I was embarrassed and I, and I was discouraged. And so coming off of that call, somebody asked me, like, where are you have the most hope and the most excited? And I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> then what happened is what often happens to me. Then I left this conversation with this larger pastor and I ended up in this context with all these different other pastors. And I realized what gives me hope is the diversity of the church that is as diverse as you can get, mm. that is all working on the same issue. How do we bring forth the gospel in our context in a different way when there's no expertise? Like, so I, I say, I often, I, I've sp <laughs> in the last few years, I have spoken to three different types of Presbyterians, two different types of Lutherans, four different types of Baptists, soon to be two different types of Methodists. Mm -hmm. And and I talk to people who are oftentimes not talking to each other, and they will come together to learn how to lead and reach their neighborhood. And that's what I experienced again last week. And that's the most encouraging, exciting thing possible. When people are willing to say the mission of God in the world is the most important thing for us to engage in. And so we need to learn to lead differently. And so we're going to learn how to collaborate and lead together. Um, those gatherings, when I'm when those places, that's the most exciting thing for me, and that's, mm. and, that's and that's it's really the humility of looking to the future and learning to collaborate together, and and that's actually you know one of the things we get to do with our adaptive church leadership cohorts all the time. We bring churches together that are as diverse as possible. Um, they might be anchored in a region, but oftentimes they're really diverse and they've never talked to each other. And all of a sudden, they are talking together about how to reach their city, how to reach their state, how to reach their community. And that work, I mean, that training is really what makes me excited, is working with people who are in real time trying to become leaders who make an impact in their community. That's good stuff. I, I'm wondering if, if there is a... Uh, and we do have some new adaptive leadership cohorts that are starting uh, in the fall uh, this year that folks can find on the Fresh Expressions uh, website. But I'm wondering, is there are there new things that Todd Bolsinger is learning along the way as he leads these adaptive leadership cohorts? I would imagine so. Mm -hmm. And is, is, is that going to result in another book and another? What, what are we looking at as far as learning from what you're learning? along yeah, the way. Yeah. So there's, there's two big pieces that I'm learning. One is, um, as we teach people and go through these adaptive church leadership cohorts, we are actually learning what actually helps people develop what we call adaptive capacity, which is your capacity to lead other people off the map. Right. And that's not just for pastors though, or leaders. It's also for, you know, um, church leaders or lay people who are taking on that responsibility. We're actually learning how to train people well. And our cohorts are better now than ever because we are learning from these folks what works and we're watching them make an impact. So one of the things I'm actually working on is a series of books on the skills to learn to be able to lead adaptively. So what are the things you have to learn? And like one of them, for example, is you have to stop trying harder. Mm. You have to train differently. If you try harder, you'll try harder on the things you've always done. You got to stop right. paddling that canoe when there's no water and you got to lift your head up and start learning as you go. For many leaders, that is really vulnerable and feels really hard. And that's really important. Um, 
The second thing I'm learning is that the giant crisis in the church is a crisis of formation. Um, I spent the better part of the pandemic on Zooms and on webinars, and I would ask people, like, what is happening in your church? What are you learning? What's been revealed in your church context um, that the pandemic showed that was there ahead of time, but you now see clearly? And almost the number one answer by far was, we have a crisis of discipleship. Yes. We are, we are not as Christian as we thought we were. Mm. Um we are following so many of the trends of the world. Like, so the way our culture is divided politically, the church is divided politically. The way that the culture has tended to like pull back and people become self-absorbed and trying to protect themselves rather than reach out to their neighbor. The church is doing the same thing. And so I'm working on a bigger book on how adaptive leadership can help us with the crisis of discipleship and how might we create a different kind of formation so that a f- the formation that can thrive in a rapidly changing world. I, I think that that, that was definitely uh, identified pretty quickly for most uh, lead pastors. And, and we see uh, just the, um, you know, so many pastors leaving ministry and, you know, and all the Barna data that came out uh, not yeah. so long ago about that. And it, it's troubling. Um, it's really difficult to, to navigate and to, to, to frankly lead through uh, what we've led through. Uh, you know, most of the time as pastors, we're, we're leading people that are in the midst of the crisis and we're not in the same crisis at the same time. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it was a whole, a whole different, a whole different ball game. Um, I know I was riveted. I was not the only person um, that was absolutely riveted by your presentation at the your keynote at the national gathering, the Fresh Expressions Na- national gathering back at the end of March, um, where you address this specific thing, um, this this crisis of discipleship and formation, and um, and um, you know what does it look like for us to really think thoughtfully about, be thoughtful about what our um, uh, what our discipleship processes are, what does formation look like that um, is deep and wide in that is resilient beyond um, the the kind of adaptive challenges that we're we're facing um, right now. So um, that being said, I think we actually shared we shared your keynote on the Fresh Expressions podcast. Yeah. That was a big bonus. So if y'all didn't catch that, you can go back and. Um, and look for that on um, on season one in our episodes. That was a, a bonus. But Todd, um, say a little bit about um, what co- what's coming next uh, for you. I guess I, you said you're doing a series of um, of books on this. So say a little bit. Say a little bit more. Yeah. So most of the work I'm doing. So um, I, I have an interesting great opportunity, which is basically that, um, I have my own company that does consulting and coaching and speaking. And I then also lead the church leadership Institute of Fuller that runs these cohorts and does research on them. So I'm a little bit like a doctor who has a medical practice. And then I get to teach at the med school and do research at the med school. And I have 64 doctoral students in different from graduates to new in the cohort. We're starting a brand new cohort in, in Houston this next year. So we'll probably have another 20 which means I am working with students and with leaders all over the country. And part of it for me is really trying to capture that learning and pass that on to the church as quickly as possible. Um, I wake up every day getting to help faith leaders thrive as change leaders. And what we're discovering is the big part of that thriving for ourselves and for our little company is that we have to be adapting. We've got to be learning and do, and living in the very same thing that we're teaching. And so a huge part of it is doing consulting with churches on the ground, taking them through the process, coaching leaders who are leading change, starting cohorts for smaller churches who need to do that together um, and can do that with diversity. Like there's going to be a whole group of rural churches who are joining one of our cohorts this next year because they're going to work on the specific challenges of rural churches. Um, those are the kind of things that make me really excited. It's leaders taking the work into their particular context and actually making it thrive because they know their context better than anybody. And I get to learn alongside them uh, about how that applies. Now, I know we're going to have listeners that are like, okay, I I get it. Like, this is needed. Where do I start? What do I do first? Um, These cohorts sound great, and that might be a a possibility for me, but what can I do 
today to, to move uh, toward adaptive leadership in my, in my local context? Well, the first thing you can do is get, is try to find some other people who see the problem also, right? That's the first thing you can do is gather. Like I always say, find your own little core of discovery. <laughs> like um, in, uh, in our adaptive leadership work, we call that a transformation team. Find a small group of people, four, five, six, read the books, start learning some stuff together. If you can join our cohort, join our cohort, because take f- six people from your church, like it can be the pastor, it could be others, and just say, look, we are going to go learn and we're going to be the, the scout group that goes ahead and brings a, brings back what we learn. Um, it's affordable. It's it's exciting. There's a lot to learn. So uh, the, the best thing you can do is gather a small group of people and begin to learn together. Um, I, my my uh, company, A.E. Sloan Leadership, um, has resources that we give available to people. We got workshops and classes and courses that we make available also. And so we'll, you can give the, uh, the details in the, in the show notes, but what you'll discover is between or- organizations like fresh expressions, our company, the cohorts that we're doing, the problem isn't finding out what the next step is. The problem is just getting some people and taking the next step because the hard part is what we mostly want to do is double down on what we've always been doing. And that's really hard. That's the that's the canoeing the mountains moment. It's acknowledging that the boat that brought you this far is not going to take you forward and you're going to have to drop it and let it go. Yeah. And teaching people, gather a group of people who are willing to let go of some of the things of the past and learn as you go becomes the key to moving forward. That's good. Yep. The maps that got us here won't get us where we need to go for sure. (laughs) I think I've quoted that. I think I've quoted that a couple of times at least. (laughs) So, um, uh, is there a question that I haven't asked you that I should be asking you or something that you haven't shared that, um, that you would like to share you think is important to share? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the question that I often, people are afraid to ask, which is, who are the churches that won't make it? Like, what are the churches that are going to, are not going to make it? Um, it's like, we all don't want to think that's us, but it, it, churches are closing. Churches are declining. And, and, and really here's, here's the hard, brutal answer. It's the churches that cling to the past. I say it's churches who decide that it's not about discovering a world. It's about canoeing. It's about preserving the great history of canoeing. It's about trying to make better canoes and tell people stories about canoes and protect the canoeing guilds and all the things. I mean, almost every church I know is standing right here on the precipice of the Lemhi Pass. They are looking at the future that it looks totally different and they got to decide what to do. And some literally decide we are going to go back. We're going to go back. We're going to fight for the past. We think that somehow God was more present in the past than today. We want to get the world. We want to get the world back to the way it was. Those folks are not going to make it. There are others who are just trying to stand, stay right here on the Lemhi Pass. I said they want to set up an Airbnb with a view, talk about the future, but actually not go. The folks who are going to make it are going to be groups of folks who are willing to let go and learn as they go. And that's why in many churches, it starts with a small group of people who love their church enough to begin to to learn and experiment their way forward. And sometimes it's just a small group of people who come alongside a pastor who's really dedicated to doing this, but they're really afraid that they're going to be alone and saying, we'll go with you. We'll be the little core of discovery that goes with you. We'll be the folks who will will be part of it. Because if you don't have that, you will die. There's, I just don't know any other way to say it. I can't help but be, remi- be reminded of uh, Jesus sending out the 70 or 72, depending on the translation, uh, mm-hmm. and um, and telling them to take nothing with them <laughs> and yeah. to rely on on those whom they encounter, to eat what's put in front of them, and uh, and to look for the people of peace, those those door openers that are going to uh, build help us build trust in, in places like, like I, I'm not even going to try to say your name, but... <laughs> <laughs> but who are those people? Hard G, um, Sakagawea, Sakagawea, and 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 instead of taking those canoes with us to to go, um, kind of empty-handed into the the places that that God is at work already, 
and um, enjoying what the spirit is doing. Todd, this has been a great conversation. I know many folks will be encouraged by it and, um, and, and are leaning in uh, to hear more and to learn more. Um, would you be so kind as to offer a prayer for, uh, I know many leaders and, and pastors that are um, navigating some pretty challenging territory in front of them before we, before we close out? Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to. Dear God, this is just a, co- a conversation amongst two colleagues who eagerly desire for you to be seen in our work. And I pray for anybody who hears this, um, we don't expect it to have a big uh, a big following. It's not going to be famous or popular or go viral. But I believe and we believe that there will be people who hear this podcast who you want to speak to particularly about being those who would say yes to your call to move into the future, um, to have the courage to let go of the things that have brought them this far, to be willing to be wise about what they preserve and hold on to, to be able to um, learn as they go and to encourage other leaders that they find along the way. And I pray that you will bless them, that you will give them other kindred souls who will walk with them and that together we might find that there's just a whole host of us who are willing to believe that you are at work so that every single piece of creation can be filled with folks who pray your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Todd, so much for your very valuable time. And we look forward to continuing to work together with the Fresh Expressions Movement and our adaptive church leadership cohorts. Um, We will have uh, all of the information on those in the show notes, as well as the other things that we've talked about in this podcast. And um, please remember to like and subscribe and share this uh, with others that uh, that might be benefited by it. And we thank you so much. Fresh Expressions is a worldwide movement of everyday missionaries who want to see churches thrive in the places we eat, play, work, and yes, even in our traditional churches. To learn a simple five-phase process for starting a new expression of church, go to freshexpressionsus.org backslash how to start. The Fresh Expressions podcast is hosted by Gannon Sims and me, Heather Jalad. It's edited by Joel Limbaum and produced by Kathleen Blackie and Chris Morton. Our national director is Dr. Christopher Backert. If you've learned something or been encouraged by this podcast, please help us spread the word. You can give us a review on Apple Music or Spotify and share this episode on social media. Now, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that God's ways may be known on earth your salvation among all nations.